How's everyone doing? Three-day weekends help. Four-day would help more. Um, all right, questions? Yes? Um, for programming assignment four, when, we're, uh, when we create the new nodes, do those new nodes save to the file as well? Or? Yeah, first save them to your tree, mm -hmm. right? Update the tree, and when you're done, just call your recursive traversal that writes your tree out to the file. Okay. So every time that you finished updating the tree, dump it out to the file. To where it's the same tree as before next time you load it up? The same file that you read from originally, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that the next time you run the game from scratch, it'll read that updated tree. And again, don't try to write the file directly. Don't try to update the file directly. Update the tree in memory and then just do an NLR traversal out to a file. <coughs> Save your file somewhere in case you clobber it. <laughs> save it outside before you like start debugging. If you've got the good stuff in it. Other questions? Yeah. So just more about like printing to the sorry like using the print writer. Mm -hmm. So how do we know exactly like so if we found like our answers and the incorrect answer? How do we find out lines to replace it? Like you don't. You don't tinker with the file at all. You update the tree in memory, right? So they've, they've come down and said it's a dog, and you say no, does it uh, meow? And you make a new branch, cat dog, right? And once you finish that, now you just call your NLR traversal code and say, read my tree, dump it out to the file. And you rewrite the entire file from start. You ditch the old file, just rewrite it from the tree. Right. Uh, say again? So when we use, like you probably mentioned, when we use print writer, do we need to add something to make sure it rewrites over everything? Or it no, it'll automatically write over. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a whole lot easier than, than trying to find the right line and figure out how to update it in the file. Because like, like the, 20, the 20 question one, the file that you had, it had like multiple answers for different yeah, yeah. questions. And I was like, OK, like, you can't just search for like the Nope. <laughs> No, and you might, you, might, you might end up adding a new node here, and you might put the answer right after it, and the other answer might be like somewhere else in the file, weird. And it's, it's kind of all chaotic looking. OK, good, good. Yeah. Whenever I did mine, and I did print writer over my database file, if there was stuff in the database file, it would just clobber it, and then wouldn't write anything to it whenever I tried using the write, but if I deleted it before writing to it, then it worked fine. Did you definitely close it after you were done writing? I thought I did, but it might have not. Okay. Right now I just have to delete the file and then... Okay, you shouldn't have to delete it, but um, but it might change the way that it gets cached maybe. If it's an empty file and you write to it, maybe it's going to appear even if you don't close it or something. Double check, see if you closed. and. If you did and it wasn't doing that, let me see it because that's interesting. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> so I'm not going to take roll for the rest of the class, so we're good with that. Um, all right. Um, questions about your final SLP project upload because I've already gotten a bunch of questions and I would like to avoid getting inundated by questions 12 hours before the deadline <laughs> so let's and and do you want those questions answered more than 12 hours before so you have time to deal with it um, do, does every group ever have to make an individual report? no so you can make one report per group but I'd like each member to upload a copy so when I go through, I don't have to cross-reference to find uh, who uploaded your report. But yeah, one one report per group. You just have for the code and tell what to submit, and then post give you a link to it. Yeah, if you got a lot of code, you can just put a link to somewhere online. Um, that's fine. <coughs> Otherwise, your PDF is like. Whew. But if you've only got a few lines of code, you can put it right in the report. That's yeah. fine, too. So
So everybody knows kind of what I'm looking for in a report here? Uh, do you want our code in it? I haven't really looked over, but... So if you have a few lines of code, you can put that directly in the report. If you have a lot of code, I suggest posting it like on Git okay. and then putting a link to it or Google or whatever your favorite cloud mm -hmm. place is. If you put, you know, 20 pages of code in your report, that's not going to bother me. But if it's a 21-page report and 20 pages are just source code, that's basically a one-page report, right? It's not going to fool me into thinking you've done a lot of writing. <laughs> so, but I don't mind having all your code in the report itself because it's just a PDF. I'm not printing it out. How many people are reading this for the first time in eight weeks? <laughs> so, um, so, so this is this is like a a uh, technical article or a research paper, right? It's not a outline. It's not a bullet pointed list. It's not a one page PowerPoint thing that you use in the presentation. This is a full on technical report. Okay. So first and foremost, it should read like a report, um, which means it should have some sections to it, right, like a report. It should probably have a cover page with your name, the name of the people you're working with, the date, the project title, the course, all the usual stuff you might put on a cover page. And then here's some sections that I would like to see. You don't have to have every single one of these sections, but this is an idea of, you know, um, Objectives, what are we trying to do? We're trying to make a video game that's going to be like Skyrim, but it'll be multiplayer, okay? Um, alternative solutions, well, there's this and there's that and there's this other thing and, you know, this is really cool, but we couldn't do that, yeah. No, not necessarily. Um, I mean, if you didn't do anything, that'll get taken into consideration. But no, I mean, the goal is to try to get here, and if you get, you know, somewhere here, that's fine. Um, but but definitely talk about it, right? So I wanted to do this, but you know, I made it this far, and and you know, if I had done something, I might have made it further, or you know, that was unreasonable or whatever. Just talk about it. That's all good. So objectives, alternative solutions is, is you know, things that you tried and, and maybe gave up on, um, maybe things that other pe people are doing, um, things that you considered and, and decided not to pursue and so on. Um, and then what did you decide to do as your solution, right? So here's the system I came up with. I took a porcupine, I put it on a treadmill, and I put a bowl of raisin bran on the other side of, of a, an aquarium tank. and and I played Beethoven for it, and suddenly I had a time machine, right? Okay, so that's your solution specification. So talk about it, right? Um, and you don't have to have a system diagram and a block diagram and high levels, but, but you know, take the reader through. The reader knows nothing about what you're doing, knows nothing about your solution, has never heard of this project before, right? And you're trying to make them an expert in, you know, a handful of pages of a written document. So they understand engineering, they understand programming, right? If you're doing an Android app, they probably understand a fair amount about Android app development. You can assume your target audience is, is qualified in whatever area, but they don't know anything about your porcupine-based time machine or your multiplayer Skyrim-like game, right? So those are the things you want to be describing. Um, and the bullets I have here are basically, you know, high level view, more detail, more detail, more detail, lowest level view, right? Which is where you're down to like circuit diagrams, lines of code, or a reference to lines of code in the cloud and things like that. Um, and then, you know, if you got something, simulation, real pieces of the final project, whatever you have, right, have you done some testing on it? Your goal is hopefully to come up with something that works, right? What does it mean to say it works? So how, how are you testing this, right? Um, you know, I got two computers and I hooked them on my home network and I pretended I was playing both sides of a game and, and I was able to attack myself, right? That's a good test plan, right? <laughs> okay, so just, just spec that out, right? And then the other stuff is, is 
if you were to continue this down the road, what would you do next, right? Well, there are other enhancements and so on. Um, lessons learned. Um, what did you take away from this? What did you learn? What, um, you know, and it can be engineering, computer science-y things that you learned. It can be more soft skill things that you learned about time management and expectations and, and goal setting and whatever, right? Working with people who, um, who live in another country um, and take the class online can be tricky. Um, and then make sure you put in a license term section, right? And this does not have to be legalese, okay? There's, there's a boilerplate license here, if you don't mind the thing just being totally opened up, published on a website, as is for everybody to see and admire and possibly build on, you can put this in there. But if you have different license terms, if you don't want anybody to use this, if you don't want it published, just say, I don't want this published, this is private, um, please don't post this anywhere and that's that's sufficient but put it in a section called license terms so that if somebody is looking at this report meaning he's not or me um, it's clear what your what your wishes are make sense all right I don't remember when I made this due when does it do Monday. Monday okay that makes sense cool and there's no posters for, for the SLP, so um, this is your deliverable um, instead of a poster upload. Any other questions on this or anything else? All right, cool. So we were we were playing with Yoda and Darth on Friday. Um, Darth Vader would probably object to being called Darth. I don't know. <laughs> um, we were playing with with the voting system, and we saw you know all kinds of problems here. where the vote counts aren't coming out right, and we said that this was um, this was happening in um, using the setters and getters, so we read a variable from this other thread, uh, we modify it, we write it back, and if two threads are doing this at the same time, their actions can overlap with one another. Um, this also happens with um, the ATM machine. <coughs> so you've got a bank. And you've got an ATM. And the bank keeps track of how much money you have in your account, and you can use the ATMs to deposit or withdraw money. So there's some kind of communication here. And so here's here's the classic scenario. At two o'clock, um, your uh, job decides to deposit your paycheck for you, right? So, um, job starts, paycheck deposit, and let's say your balance is $80 in your account. So the job is going to deposit your paycheck, which is $100. So read balance, which is 80 Add check. So you've got $180. 
and then um, send 180 to the bank. Tell the bank you've got $180 in your account. Um, the night before you won the lottery, right? And so you've got a check for a hundred million dollars. So you take that to the ATM to deposit it, of course, right? So here you're going to deposit hundred million dollars. So you read the balance. You add the deposit. So that's the money, and you say you send that to bank. So now your balance in the bank is a hundred million dollars plus eighty. And now ATM two finishes up its transaction, which was okay. Send your new balance, which is a hundred eighty dollars, to the bank, and so now your balance is a hundred and eighty dollars. And it's the same thing, right? You've got to read, modify, write. You've got to read, modify, write. If they're allowed to both run at the same time, you can get unexpected, undesirable consequences. Um, and so if you atomize these read, mo read, modify, write operations, once the job started its deposit action, it would have a lock on this balance. And at this point, when you start to try to read the balance, it would say, no, you have to wait. So this would read the 80, add 100, send 180 back, now you've got 180. This would release the lock, and now ATM1 gets an exclusive lock. So now it reads the balance, it's $180. It adds the million dollars, so you've got a million 180. And then it deposits that. So the same thing that was happening with the voting system. So there's a keyword in Java, synchronized, which we can use to say I want this following block of code to be run exclusively by one thread. And so synchronized, it goes with a block. So this code right here is synchronized, and it's synchronized on an object, um, H. So Synchronizing means raising a flag up and first checking to see if anybody else has locked it. And if not, you raise a flag and say, I've got exclusive access to this code. Nobody else can run it. Okay? We have to tell it what flag to use for that, and we can use any object that we want. So I simply created um, a class named huh. which does nothing, but I can create an object of type, huh? Um, so up here I construct a huh object, and I pass that to each of the voting machines. So each voting machine has that same object, so they're all using the same flag, right? And only one thread can grab that flag at a time. So down here, When I say synchronize on H, whichever thread gets to this first is going to grab the flag associated with that object and take possession of it and hold it up and say, I've got exclusive access. And any other thread that tries to kick in while that's happening is going to have to wait. Does that make sense? So if I run this, everything works out fine. The vote count comes out the way we expected. And it runs a fair bit slower because things aren't happening quite as parallel. So if I were to do the following, construct an object inside this thread and use that in my synchronized block. Or 
vote count goes wacky again. And it goes wacky because now each thread has its own flag, right? The H that I construct right here in, say, the first thread is totally different from the H constructed in the second thread. And since each thread has its own flag, right, this thread one raises its H flag and says, nobody else can take this flag, I've got it because I'm running this code. Well, thread two comes in, it's got its own flag. And it looks, does anybody else have this flag? No, so it raises its flag and they're still running simultaneously. So it doesn't really matter what object we use here, but make sure that if you want two threads synchronized, that they're both using the same object, okay? Not just the same type of object, but the actual same object. Yeah? What kind of objects can you use in the Pretty much anything. Can you use primitives? No. Can't use primitives, but you can use any object. All right, I've had lots of things go wrong when I've demoed this this week, so um, let's see if I can make something else go wrong. So this is an object, right? So I've synchronized on this, and my vote is still going wrong, right? And what's the problem? Well, this is, is different for each thread, right? It's the same type of thing. It's an instance of the class voting machine, but this in thread one is fundamentally different from this in thread two. It's fundamentally different from this in thread three. They're different objects, right? Now, in some cases, if you start Googling and you look at how to synchronize, you'll see that this is a common thing to synchronize on as long as the this that you're using is the same one for all three. So typically you pass your this to the threads that you're creating or something. But, um, but go back and, and think about what you're locking on and make sure that it's actually the same. So can you do like super that, that extend back to the That's a good question. Oh, uh, we're not, ex um, I don't think that will do it. I don't even know if it'll accept it, but the super class, I think would still be different for each instance. Um, and I don't know if it'll compile. Yeah, it doesn't seem to like that. Yeah, super is is not really the same as this in that sense. This is actually an object, right? It's who I am. But super is is referring to something in the parents um, class, the class that you extended. But I think it's usable as a way to access a field or a method. But I don't think super actually is a thing. Although now you got me curious. Definitely does not like super. All right, but the thises are definitely different. Thread two, thread one, thread zero. All right, other questions, comments? So um, a really useful method inside thread is sleep. 
and sleep you can pass a number of milliseconds and it basically puts the current thread to sleep. And that's useful if you want to sort of relinquish your access to the CPU and let other threads have a chance to run. Or if you know that you're not going to be doing anything until some event occurs, right, you can say while well, true and just sit there and spin, but you're chewing up the CPU and you're getting a chunk of a slice of time along with everything else. So sleep will actually put you to sleep and it throws you in a different state in the operating system. And you can sleep a number of milliseconds or you can sleep milliseconds and nanoseconds. Um, and sleep can throw an exception, so it's got to go in a try-catch block. And so here's just something which sleeps a certain amount of time. Um, so I have something called delay and it just takes a time t and it calls thread.sleep. Oh yeah, and sleep is um, a static. So you don't need a thread to be able to call sleep. In fact, you don't want to call it from a thread. You call it from the class name thread with an uppercase t. So uppercase t thread.sleep. Um, So that's all you really need, right? Except you got to put the, the call to sleep inside a try catch block. Java sleep, it's starting, it waits five seconds, two, one, zero, and it's done. So that's useful. The other thing is interrupts. And so we can have software interrupts that work very similar to hardware interrupts, but um, you can interrupt a thread and it doesn't actually stop the thread from running or kill the thread it simply sets a flag okay this is what happens in a pick processor when an interrupt event occurs when a timer expires when you raise an interrupt pin it doesn't actually do anything to the CPU it just sets a flag right but if that flag is such that you've told the system when I get an interrupt request flag of this type I want to do the following right then something will happen but it's really just setting a flag and you can have interrupts totally disabled you can still set these flags and check these flags in a pick so same thing in threads um, so there's an interrupt method which interrupts the thread and then there's an interrupted test to tell if it's been interrupted, and there's an is interrupted, which also tells if it's been interrupted. So interrupt basically says set the interrupt flag. Um, interrupted checks to see if you've been interrupted, and it clears the interrupt flag, right, if, if it was set. Um, is interrupted does not clear the flag. It's kind of a peak at the interrupt flag. But interrupted will check to see if you've been interrupted. It'll return a true or false, but it will also clear the flag if it was set. So you can only really kind of use that once per interrupt, which is actually useful. So you could make a while loop that's sleeping, right? And if you interrupt it, it should throw an interrupted exception. So you can break out of things. And the general subject of, of thread interaction is a whole topic in itself. Um, join is useful sometimes, waits for this thread to die. Um, so if you're running a thread and you want to wait until that thread is finished, you can say name of that thread dot join, and this will come back after that thread has exited. Right, and you can also specify a time limit, number of milliseconds or millis nanos, and it will come back either when the thread dies or when that much time has passed. <coughs> And all of these things can be useful for um, 
managing multiple processes, multiple threads, and they can all be somewhat tricky. So, um, so Dijkstra, Dijkstra's algorithm, posed a problem which um, is called the dining philosopher's problem. And what Dijkstra was interested in was basically having multiple things happening on a machine where there was some sort of sharing of resources that had to be managed. So here's an example. User one wants to read what's on a magnetic tape and copy it out to the printer, right? So they've got a file on a tape, they put that on a tape reader, and they run something that should read from the tape reader and send it to the printer, okay? So it has to allocate two resources. It has to allocate the tape reader and it has to allocate the printer. Um, meanwhile, user two is um, running a status report on the system. And so it's going to go through and do diagnostics on different pieces of the system and print out a report. Okay, so the first thing they need to do is they need to allocate the printer so they can produce the report and then they need to allocate each of the pieces of hardware they're gonna test. So user one um, says, okay, I need the printer and I need the tape unit. So let's see if we can do this. This is preamble to dining philosophers. So thread one um, is saying copy tape to printer. Thread two is doing diagnostics and sending those to the printer. All right, so let's have thread one start first. and allocates the tape unit. And it's gonna allocate the printer. And then it's gonna copy the tape to the printer. And then it's gonna release the tape reader. And it's gonna release the printer. Okay, and thread two is going to say, um, allocate the printer. It's going to test, uh, I don't know, what else do we connect? Test the scanner. Release the scanner. Allocate the tape reader, test the tape reader, release the tape reader, and so on. All right, so let's say time one, thread one allocates the tape reader. Time two, thread two allocates the printer. Time step three, thread one is trying to allocate the printer and it can't, right? So it's waiting for the printer to be available. So time step four, three, two allocates the scanner, tests it, releases it, and then it tries to allocate the tape reader and it can't because the tape reader is in use. And so thread one is waiting for the printer, thread two is waiting for the tape reader. Neither of them can get the resource they want and neither of them is going to release their resource until they've gotten further in their processing, right? And so both of these threads are, are completely locked and they're making no progress. They're just sitting there spinning, looking for this resource, right? Um, and that's a problem and it's called deadlock. And so Dijkstra was interested in analyzing the situation in general and trying to figure out how to resolve this. Um, so he posed this, this thought experiment of the dining philosophers. So here's the setup. You have five philosophers um, who are going to have dinner together. 
So we'll call our philosophers A, B, C, D, E. And they're sitting around a table. And there's an infinite bowl of noodles in the middle. There's my blue noodle bowl. So unlimited supply of noodles. And they can eat as much as they want. Okay. And they can talk as much as they want, but they can't talk while they're eating and vice versa. So they're going to eat a little and they're going to talk a little and they're going to eat and so on. You know how philosophers are, right? Um, so in between each pair of philosophers is a chopstick. And in order to eat, a philosopher has to have two chopsticks. And as soon as they have two chopsticks, they can start eating. And when they're done eating, they can put down the chopsticks and then they can talk. And so the question is, what are the algorithms we can use to control the behavior of the philosopher such that nobody starves, they all get to eat, they all get to talk? Time limits. Time limits. <clears throat> it's a good option. Um, even before we get to time limits, there's a question of how to start this. So you could just say, OK, each philosopher, pick up a chopstick on your left, pick up a chopstick on your right. If you can't get to a chopstick, wait a few seconds and try again. Right? So, um, so each philosopher picks up a chopstick on their left. So A is going to grab that one, B is going to grab that one. Um, this one's going to go to C, this one's going to go to D. This one's going to go to E. Now they each have one chopstick. Now they try to pick up a chopstick on the right, and it's not available. So they wait a few seconds, and it's still not available, and it's never going to be available. right? So this is deadlocked. Everybody starves. So you could say, well, what else could you say? Start your threads, right? So you can like start thread one, and then thread one's going to try and get both the this thing, and then he's going to walk his two resources. OK. Right? And then, you know, the next start will start, and it's going to try and lock these two resources. But if you can't get one, then he won't lock the other one. So you're going to make a schedule for the philosophers for when they should try to eat, basically? Yeah. OK. So you can, you can identify the philosophers. You can make a schedule and say, OK, A is going to start at 5 o'clock, and then B is going to try at 5.01, and so on and so forth, right? And that's, that's a solution to this. Um, it's a solution that requires knowing ahead of time what the resources are, what the things using those resources are, and needs somebody to come up with, with a plan for that. Um, and in a computer, a lot of times, we don't have that option, right? Because we don't know what jobs are going to run, right, and what they're going to need ahead of time. So what could we do that might let these people figure it out for themselves? Something a little more autonomous, maybe. <coughs> yeah? Could you set it up so that, like, so you can always have, well, not always, but you can have two running and then two others running when they're done and then the final one runs. And then, but since, but since you don't know when one will finish, you just set it up so, like, C goes first and E goes second. And then whenever either of those gets done, B goes next. And after that, would it be D and then A? OK, so you could do that. That's another version of a schedule, basically. Okay. Right? Saying that C gets to go first, so they can get both of their chopsticks. And maybe E gets to go at the same time, so they can get both of their chopsticks. And then everybody eats for a fixed amount of time. When they're done, they put their chopsticks down. And once you get that started, you can probably have it keep, keep circulating. So that might be a solution. Yeah? Perhaps maybe have the ball move oh. where well, it's in front of like uh, B, A, and C are able to eat because they both have two chopsticks available towards them. Oh. Once they finish, the ball moves to like A, then B and E can eat. That's interesting. Have one moving point. I'm trying to think what that might be analogous to. Um, so it's kind of like a rotating permission. Mm -hmm. Right, you get permission to eat when the bowl's <coughs> <close> to you. <coughs> so yeah, that could work. Do you have something? I would summarize, you're gonna say making get in the line 
and then hand out two chopsticks at a time to each person. Yeah, so change the problem. <laughs> this is often like the best solution. Um, yeah, so if, if they're in a line, um, that's another form of scheduling in some sense, right? Depending on what order they're in in the line. Implement a queue. Yeah. <laughs> Similar to the putting the ball in front of everybody, could you put all the resources in the center, like all of the chopsticks in the center? And then from there, whenever someone's thinking, they don't need chopsticks, and then whoever is so automatically queues. Mm -hmm. um, so then they take them from the middle when they want to eat. <laughs> okay, but they can grab any two chopsticks that are available. <laughs> well, uh, no, no, like oh, you can only have two chopsticks at a time. You can't take one. Okay. Yeah. So, so and then from there, it's just automatically queues back up. Okay. Um, That might work, but if they're still taking chopsticks one at a time. Two at a time. Yeah, so if they can take two at a time, that gets you out of this. But in a, an operating system, that would be the question of how do I allocate the printer and the card reader at the same moment, right? Or basically, how can I atomize that operation? So that's what's happening when we do synchronized in Java. Right, we're still only taking one chopstick at a time where we're saying, okay, I'm the only person who can touch the chopstick pile right now. I'm gonna take one, I'm gonna take the second. Now I'm releasing my hold on the chopstick pile and you're guaranteed you either got two or you were waiting because somebody else was working with the chopstick. So that's what synchronized does, right? It basically atomizes, it makes the process of getting two chopsticks a single atomic thing that can't be, uh, you can't only get halfway through it and then have something go wrong. If you start, you're guaranteed to succeed. So that's a nice job of approach. Other ideas? Fox scissor paper. So to get away from the scheduling idea, maybe you start up each philosopher in like a thinking state, mm -hmm. and then they think for a random amount of time, or they like sleep for a random amount of time. Mm -hmm. And then they will attempt to grab the chopsticks on the right and left. Yes. The synchronized function. Right. And that works perfectly, um, other than the possibility that it's possible that that random amount of time is always the same. <laughs> right? Practically, that's a great solution. Um, theoretically, you could end up with the same kind of deadlock. Right. Um, so another, another thing you can do is, is pick up chopstick on your left, and then try to pick up the chopstick on your right. And if you can't, then put your chopstick down for one minute, and then try again, All right? And that will work if they're eating for random amounts of time, or if they're holding them for random amounts of time. But, you know, if they all started at the same time, they'd all pick up the chopsticks, they'd all put them down, they'd wait 30 seconds, they'd all pick them up again, you'd have the same kind of situation. It's a little more like a live lock, where you're changing state, but you're still not moving beyond a certain point in your algorithm. Um, and so that, that can be tricky. Um, yeah? chopstick on your right and then if you can't pick up the chopstick on your left take it from someone <laughs> but if you had a chopstick taken from you you can't try and take it from someone for one minute but what if you're taking one from someone at the same time that they're taking it from you yeah, so, oh yeah you're right so it's back to the atomic thing but i like that that would that would be an interesting dinner party <laughs> that's cool So one, one sort of solution is to number the chopsticks. Well, wait, what if we went back to the whole stealing them and gave each philosopher a uh, different level of aggression? And if your aggression was higher, then you're able to take that chopstick. Okay. That may be similar to what I'm about to say, which is numbering the chopsticks. Yeah. Okay. Right? So if you number the chopsticks, the idea is um, you always pick up the lower number chopstick first of the two that are on either side. And so when this begins, philosopher A is going to take chopstick one. Uh, philosopher B would like to pick up chopstick one but can't, right? 
or maybe B would pick up chopstick one and A wouldn't be able to, but only one of these is going to be able to pick up a stick because one is the lowest number for both of them. Philosopher C is going to pick up stick two. Right, Philosopher D is going to pick up stick three. And Philosopher E is going to pick up stick four. And now you pick up the other stick if you have the option. Well, either A or E is going to grab stick five, right? One of them will succeed. Um, and uh, D will be out of luck. Um, C should be able to, sorry, C or D will grab stick three, right? And A or B is gonna be out of luck. Um, but in the end, there will be philosophers who have two chopsticks, right, and can begin eating. Um, and so it at least gets you out of a deadlock, but it doesn't necessarily ensure that everybody eventually eats. You can still have starvation, which is where the system's running and jobs are doing their things and they're starting, they're completing, but there's some jobs that are, that are still locked, right? And it's not the whole system that's locked, but you can have resource starvation. Um, so another solution is to have a wait person, which is kind of like scheduling, somebody who decides which person's gonna get which chopsticks in some order, right? Um, so a waiter analogy for, for the dining, but basically another form of scheduling. So there's, there's a lot of, of resources about this problem, and it's, it's just a way to um, think about some of these operating system issues in a kind of more generic model. So a system programming course, you'll spend time studying dining philosophers. Um, all right, we are out of time. Um, I think we'll start playing with networking tomorrow. So we'll start doing some, some sockets and some client server work. And this will be good stuff.